That's not a comic book. Now that's a comic book. Hi everyone, welcome to another episode of Comic Reviews. I'm Sid Part 2, and I've got a fair amount of books tonight, and it's a bit of a late start, unfortunately. Um, so yeah, I'm probably just going to get right into it in a minute or two here. Not going to wait too terribly long. I'm going to reorganize stuff. Uh, what can I talk about while I just wait for some people to show up? Um, show this off, I guess. I reorganized all my books. My room is now... Now, comic room free. You'll see pictures on the front of all the long boxes and stuff. Uh, I printed off a, or not printed off, I, I cut out a thing from different uh, preview mags and such to slap right on the front of the books, or the boxes, so I'd know what was in that box. And then I have a list in each box of what's in the box. And some of them have pictures of Brad Pitt saying, What's in the box? So yeah, exciting times here at Sid Part 2 Enterprises. Alrighty. Well, well, let's just go ahead and get into it. This week on Comic Reviews, we'll be talking about Zorro Legendary Adventures Book 2, number 2. Wonder Woman, number 69. Ha <laughs> ha! Action Comics... Number 1010, or 1010. Justice League Dark, number 10. Doctor Strange, number 13. Batman Beyond, number 31. Heroes in Crisis, number 8. And for Trade Talk tonight, we'll be discussing The Unstoppable, ah, the Unstoppable Wasp, Volume 2, Agents of Girl. Yay. Uh, so yeah, plenty of stuff to get into tonight. Should be a grand old time. Uh, Alright, let's go ahead and start with Zorro Legendary Adventures, book two. So, I generally, I, I feel like I say the same things about this book every week. Um, sometimes it's better than others. Sometimes it says some problematic ass shit, but generally I just kind of enjoy it. Uh, this is one of those cases where I think I'm, I'm really, the only thing I have to talk about week to week is the art and whether or not I feel it's good for the time, um, or just acceptable for the time. Um, so for those that, that don't know, this series was originally, uh, printed in a French Disney magazine, just, uh, printed Zorro comic strips that went along with the the world of the Guy Williams show and yeah um so now this is like just translating those to English for the first time um and really they're they're pretty much exactly what you'd expect for for the time um and and for like a Disney comic Disney's never never really done good comics in my opinion um and so this is pretty much just like, yeah, okay, Zorro has an adventure, and then that's the end of it. Uh, and then they don't really, they don't put a ton of effort in their comics, uh, as far as I can tell. I've never really read Disney comics that, um, and be, to be fair, I've not read a ton of Disney comics, but story-wise on Disney comics, it, it always does feel very much like a tie-in, like a marketing thing, and less like, hey, someone's actually got a story to tell that they are really impassioned about and we're gonna, you know, give all these resources to them so they can tell that story. It's more just like a, okay, just make up something, just make sure it doesn't contradict anything we're doing with the character. Uh, it's, it's always the impression I get from a lot of Disney-owned property here. Um, kind of why I've fallen off the Star Wars books a bit. Um, and so, like, the first story, uh, some guys dress up as Zorro and is turned over to the police and th his partner gets the reward money and he was supposed to come break him out so they could share the reward money but then he took off with the money and it's up to z the real Zorro to solve this problem um really not much to say about that story it's fine I, I could see that being kind of the premise for an episode of the show um 
this feels like a returning artist because uh, I, I read some of this stuff before and this looks a lot better but unfortunately they just don't give him much to do that's of any real consequence um like i, I feel the artist on on this first volume on uh, this first story uh the sergeant sees double by carlo marcello um and francois francois cortegiani that's definitely not how you say it um so whichever one of those two is the artist, like, they do a really good job, and I, I think it looks good. This, you know, if you had modern coloring on here, this would probably stand up really well. I mean, it's kind of like the blank backgrounds, but that's still something that's done in comics today. Um, so this could work in a modern context if the coloring were just updated. Um, I, uh, it's got, like, the classic, like, drippy comic book faces. Like, these characters were out in the rain, but still, like... You know, like, that's that's a good face. That Everything about that looks good. This is well illustrated. Which is cool. Uh, the second story is not as bad as some of the strips have been, but definitely not great. Um, like, there was this three-panel sequence here. Uh, one, two, three, uh, where Garcia is telling the people his secret plan, because that's what he do, and Bernardo he overhears it and goes to let Diego know about everything. Well, the thing is, it's like, conceptually it's well executed with putting Bernardo in the background of the panel and not drawing any attention to him. That's really great formatting for comic book stuff, but... Artistically, I have no real indication that's Bernardo unless I really, really know how this character is dressed because he's not in any of the scenes before that. Like, I think at all? Um, yeah, he's not in this, in this comic until that panel. So it's just, it's, on one hand, it's, conceptually well done but it's not formatted correctly to be executed because you have no indication that's bernardo until you get to the reveal that bernardo was listening it's just yeah the the art doesn't really communicate it's bernardo everyone's orange they're all from jersey um i just i don't know i just don't get it i just the, the art here doesn't work for me it's not as bad as some of the stuff, but it's just not as good. And the story here is uh, some bandits are kidnapping, are, are shooting the coachman and stealing the goods, and Zoro has to come up with a clever plan to catch them. Um, he, he disguises himself as a peasant and, and attacks. Um, that's fine. It's okay. The art's fine for the time. Um, but... I don't know, just... I don't like Zorro stories where he's fighting criminals. I prefer where he's fighting authority figures. And this just felt kind of bland, kind of just, all right, let's just pump a story out. So, again, I, I feel really harsh on this book. I'm not. I, I genuinely enjoyed myself when I'm reading it. It's just I don't have a ton to say about it because it's just very formulaic, very, uh, you know, bland in, in other regards. But, hey, I'm starved for Zoro content, so I'll take it. All right. Take a sip. Let's go ahead and go on and talk about Wonder Woman number 69. Nice. I, I find this exceptionally funny. It's issue 69. Everyone's making out on the cover. Steve Trevor in one of them is like, uh, Diana, is someone trying to tell us something? Um, that's funny. <laughs> I, G. Willow Wilson did it on purpose, and no one will convince me otherwise. So this is a, a particularly sexually charged issue, which is, is kind of funny. Um, the the kind of premise of G. Will Wilson's run right now is the gods are off of Olympus because of comic book shenanigans, 
And so Wonder Woman is trying to find them in the real world and and bring peace and, and yada yada yada. Um, so we start off in this sleepy town of Summer Grove, Connecticut, and we witness a man having an affair. Oh, he's so scummy. Um, but then his wife pulls up and catches him. And then she reali- she admits that she's also having an affair with their female punk rock babysitter. How edgy. Uh, and then they're like, all right, fine. We'll both go our separate ways. But you're taking the kids. No, you're taking the kids. <gasps> what could be wrong? And then we realize the whole town's like this. Everyone's just fucking um, just giving in to their wildest ambitions left and right with no thought for responsibility until Wonder Woman and her gal pals land with their pet Pegasus um, and start interacting with people. And I like it. It's like it's got just the right kind of balance for Wonder Woman because Wonder Woman kinky. Wonder Woman's into that kink shit. Um, but she's also like a really good person. And so I really like the, the balance she strives for here. Um, we've decided life's too short. Too short? Too short not to do the things we really want to do. To love the people we really want to love. And damn the consequences. Says an old ma- naked man wearing nothing but a guitar. And so we get this panel of Wonder Woman looking at him, and then she kind of smiles and is like, far be it for me to judge the desires of others. She's like, she's cool with it, she can roll with it. Um, but then the couple from the beginning is fighting, and the man threatens to hit his ex, his soon-to-be ex-wife, um, and this little argument erupts. It's not that, it's that she's saddling me with the kids. I gotta follow my heart alone. Anything else would be dishonest. Does honesty absolve you of your responsibility? You assume that nothing that feels good to you is ever hurtful to someone else? I like that. That's a good message. It's not, hey, don't do this because it feels good and feeling good is bad. It's not this weird Christian Puritan shit. It's like, okay, fine, you can do what feels good to you, but you still are an adult living in a society, so you have to regulate that behavior somehow you have to have a moral compass you have to think about how your actions affect others um that's a good nice level-headed message for a superhero comic and i quite enjoyed it um but then we get the reveal that everyone's being influenced by these fucking terrifying looking cupid things um, and so Aphrodite, who's been traveling with Wonder Woman, steps in and takes control, but then loses control again, uh, as they, they try to investigate who's controlling these, um, these cupids. Uh, I, I do really like this moment. Um, the, the normal civilian woman, I, I forget her name, that's traveling with everyone, traveling with Wonder Woman, uh, says... I always thought a goddess of love would be more cuddly and less weird slash terrifying. <laughs> Wonder Woman, ah, with the Wonder Woman with all all the good advice. Love is the most dangerous thing there is. You can calm rage, comfort sadness, but love is impeccable. I like that. Oh no, impassive. Impal. I can't say this fucking word. I, it's, I know it in my head, and I cannot say this fucking word. I feel really silly. Uh, I-M-P-L-A-C-A-B-L-E. Impalicable. Impeccable? Impeccable? I, I, it, every other word in the English language has come to mind. I can't, I can't get it out. So anyways, they find that the, the real person controlling the pixies is in fact the child of Aphrodite. Uh, Names tonight. Atlantidide. Atlantidus? Atlantidus. Yeah, sure. Um, And they've taken over this sleepy little Connecticut town and 
and have no plans of giving it back and try to stop one or one, yada, yada, yada. Um, the last story thing I had is this conversation um, between... <laughs> Maggie. Between Maggie, shit, <sighs> just had it and I lost it. Um, Cadmus, Maggie and Cadmus, the Pegasus. Uh, they're sitting there talking. Something changes in transit between one home and a, no, that's Aphrodite. Um. Maggie says, it's like people are acting on desires they'd usually only admit to on the internet and in, uh, public. I make a point of acting upon all my desires in public. It's one of the great advantages, advantages of being a quadruped. Nobody judges you. Have you ever, you know, with someone, something of another species? I'm an Olympian, my dear. Have you ever met Zeus? Or, for that matter, looked in a mirror? Hmm? Which of us has been romancing a satyr these past weeks? That's different! I will pay you a hundred dollars of your mortal money if you can tell me how. Ah, she just got called out on her bestiality by a pegasus. That's beautiful. Um, no, I just, I like that. So we're, we're in this, like, kind of fun, kind of tongue-in-cheek way telling you about these, these boundaries that exist, um, I, I, amongst people um and i just i don't know i really like that that's, that's kind of fun uh obviously it's exaggerated and it's heightened beyond a reasonable point for comics but it's it's working for me you know it's it's got the right kind of feel kind of tone to it and and i'm quite appreciating it for that reason um not sure how much i have to say in the art in this um is this the same artist that's been working on the book since the beginning of where it's the last couple issues of uh, Wilson's run. Um, okay, why can't I find... Did I miss it? Okay. Uh, Zermandio? X-E-R-M-A-N-I-C-O. Names tonight. My God. Language is hard. Zer... Manico, Zermanico. I think that's right. I'm, I'm basing the e at, or the X C off of Xerxes. Um, that's that's how I'm getting with that one. Um, and it's good. I, I'm actually quite liking the interior art. I wasn't a huge fan of the last arc with uh, the way Giganto was drawn. I was a little bit disappointed by some of that. Um, but this is looking fine. I'm enjoying it. Nice, soft uh, kind of feel to it. Um, you know, no, you don't get like a ton of action or really dynamic stuff in this issue. I will say, one of them seems a little ready to hit things. Um, and so I'm, I've been having some trouble with that. But I don't know. Like, there's action in this issue, but it's it's all feeling kind of superfluous. But it's drawn well. It looks good. Um, I don't know. Just, just kind of okay on the art. Nothing, like, super interesting to say, which usually tends to be a good thing. Um, some of the panel layouts are really cool. Like, the, you know, the, I don't know, just that intricate gutter work at the top is kind of neat um they do a thing where like they're walking and talking about like who could be doing this and then we get a silhouette of a woman's body as the the framework for the panels and that's carried over onto the next page I don't know, that was kind of interesting, I guess. Uh, I didn't really know what to make of it, what it's trying to say, but maybe that they're being watched, I guess. Um, I guess so, because like they're sitting there wondering who could be doing this, and then a giant face is made out of the 
the Cupids. Eh. Just eh. Not, not a ton to say about it. Just okay. All right. I'm going to move on. Talk about Action Comics number 1010, Leviathan Rising Part 4. Um... Eh, this issue opened really interestingly in a really intense way with director bones and like who's behind leviathan um and then from there it just kind of went downhill for me uh like it's such a great opening couple pages that that really do kind of get me hyped for leviathan rising and then it's just superman and lois lane in london like talking about being spies for Spiral, which, okay, fine, whatever, but, like, it, it doesn't really feel necessary. Like, there's this whole thing with uh, Agent Tiger and Supermans, and they're talking to him as in, in disguise as, um, you know, what's his name again? Uh... Chaz, uh, Super Chaz, um, and so like, just get a really good opening, a couple pages, and then we just kind of spin our wheels until j evil guy that blew up the DEO shows up, so Superman rushes out as Chaz to stop him, um, flies him into space, blows up. Uh, and Superman comes back to London to talk to Lois and, and Tony. Uh, sorry, Tiger. Um, and then they're both gone! I, I don't know. I really feel like, let's see here. I'll give you the, the pages for action. Alright, so we got that. And then, okay, beginning of the book worth reading, end of the book worth reading. Feels like a lot of wasted time, you know? I just, I, maybe I missed like a really important detail that's going to be super, super crazy later on. Or maybe this is like way more fun than I'm going to be in credit for. This issue just did not do it for me. I gotta say, I was, I was pretty disappointed by this one. Uh, I don't know, I'm still looking forward to the Le Leviathan Strikes thing. Uh, that sounds cool enough. Uh, we, we continue to talk about, I guess the one thing that's of value from the middle of the book is dealing with Leviathan as Talia al Ghul's organization back in Batman Inc. Um, uh, but did you know that Leviathan was originally created just to give Spiral something to do when business was bad by the same guy who created Spiral? Is that true? No, I thought it was Talia al Ghul and nope! Inherited, like everything else with her. Feels a little weak uh, as well. Um, these connections, why not just create another organization? Did he just really like the name Leviathan? He's like, oh, well, Grant Morrison already used that. All right, well, I suppose I'll create a line to make him connected. I don't know. Not not feeling this issue. Uh, still enjoying the action run a lot more than I am the Superman book. Uh, this issue, however, was probably the weakest. Still, really good introductory page there. Uh, or a couple pages, rather. Man, I got no viewers tonight. What can you do? All righty. Go ahead and go on and talk about Justice League Dark number 10. Um, I still really like this series. It just gets to feel more and more epic. We kind of get like what Dr. Fate's plan is here. We get the that expounded upon a lot more. And importantly, it's from Fate's perspective. 
uh, more or less, it's it's actually being retold, but it might as well be Fate's perspective. Um, and so that was pretty cool. Then we had, like, the, the JLD just kind of trying to come up with any kind of plan to make shit work um, and and deal with things. Meanwhile, we got Cersei, Zatanna, and Wonder Woman uh, dealing with the kind of wider implications. And this is just a book of, with a lot happening. Um, it's... It is a very complicated book, but shit starts to get kind of crazy in this, um, and I, I really like that about it. So Zatanna, you know, using a magic spell to bind an other kind in dirt. I wonder something. Can I? Leo. No, that doesn't work. What if I do negative? Will that flip my frame? No. Mm, nope. Okay. Hold on, let me see if I'm missing something. Uh, flip. There we go. Okay, let's see if this works. I'm actually really curious. <laughs> Mm, not really. Damn, I was so sure that'd work. <laughs> Damn! Damn! Okay, well, it was worth a shot. Uh, Mirror World, uh, Miss Dimension, I'm Scottish. Yeah, I mean, this issue is, like, really hard to talk about without spoiling anything um and and not so much that i'm worried about that but like there's some cool reveals in it but those reveals only really work if you've been reading the series so i mean we're we're 10 issues in uh and normally this is not something i i typically like in a comic where every story is built upon the last and built up and built up because after a while it just gets hard to keep track of everything it's working for me here. Uh, everything's kind of coming together and working for me and, and fitting together and building off of each other in a well-conceived way. Like, so we have Dr. Fate and the Lords of Order working against Earth, bringing in the other kind. And with the other kind, working against the heroes of Earth. Then we've got Wonder Woman Zatanna's stumbling onto this this big crazy thing that's been building for years in the background um that's what we call a retcon <laughs> and that's all coming together with cersei who's manipulating everything and one of the other kinds uh, or the main representative of the other kind shows up and says they have no idea you're manipula manipulating them into the witching war and i'm like there's our next story arc, uh, as probably as soon as Dr. Fate's defeated. Um, maybe after the Underkind are, are finally put to bed, if those two don't happen in tandem. Um, I don't know. It's, it's cool. I'm enjoying it. I'm not... As, as intricate as it all is, it also feels like I'm not having a hard time following the sequence of events. I'm understanding where all these things are coming from and building from. And it just, again, the thing I've really enjoyed about this series is it feels epic. I It feels really, really big and grandiose and cool. And so I can't help but enjoy it, you know? Let's go ahead and move on and talk about Doctor Strange, number 13. Uh, I love this cover. This cover is absolutely fantastic. Um, Herald Supreme is the name of this story. Uh, it kind of sounds like something you might get at Taco Bell. Uh, Alright, so the story so far. Galactus has or was attacking an alien world 
but that alien world had a bunch of alien wizards on it. Um, if you want to know what an alien wizard is, go look up a picture of Alan Moore. Um, so, the the council of wizards on this planet imbued all their power into one guy and sent him to the one place that's famous across the universe for defeating Galactus. <laughs> They're like, oh, well, it had to be a magic user that did it. So the guy goes to Doctor Strange. He's like, tell me how you beat Galactus so I can save my world. And Doctor Strange's like, I, I didn't do that. He's like, no, nah, you're lying. You don't want to tell me the secrets. Because obviously only a magic user can defeat Galactus. He's like, oh, no, no, actually, but it, it doesn't work. So the guy rips all of Strange's magic away and uses that, plus his, plus his own powers, to banish Galactus to the mystical realms, which is really just a whole other universe where the laws of physics don't work and instead laws of magic govern. Uh, which is cool. I like that idea. You know, it's the, the dark dimensions and shit like that. Um, and Strange is like, no, that's a terrible idea. Sending Galactus there, it'll just make things worse. It'll lead both worlds apart. Um, and so Strange kind of goes in looking for Galactus and finds him relatively qu quickly. But he's already fucking shit up, and he's a very unknowable force in this universe. This big gigantic demon, uh, the demon of pain apparently, comes into contact with Galactus, immediately tries to smite him, and gets busted. So Galactus is absorbing mystical energy and Strange just needs to try to find some way to defeat him, but he's fucking Galactus. He's pretty damn powerful. Um, and luckily, some of Strange's allies that reside in this dimension find him and uh, come up with a plan to assist him, and yada 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 yada. Uh, basically, Strange has to offer to become Galactus's herald and find him a world to satiate his hunger. Uh, once, in first, to do that, so he won't go crazy and eat everything in this magical world <laughs> but then after that needs to get him out of the magical world um and so strange searches planets looking for a planet in the magical realms without sentient life so he can feed galactus uh but then he stumbles upon one where a monstrous demon says be gone sorcerer and strange tries to explain his whole thing he's like I know precisely what you were doing. Word has traveled quickly. You seek sustenance for a devourer of worlds. There is much for the taking, for all the mystic realms are alive. You are no savior, you are destroyer. Please, I'm trying only to do the least harm. If I can find a living world without sentience, perhaps. Dream on. You of all mortals are aware of what happens when you enter a pact with a demon. You lose. It is impossible to keep your hands clean in this matter, precious healer. Sooner than later, you yourself will have no choice but to decide who lives and who dies. Hi! Right. I like that quite a bit. That's that's a good one. Um, just doing shit to, to f like, you know, you, you put yourself in this position. You are now the Herald of Galactus. And there's no way out of it. Uh, I like that. That works for me. <laughs> Not much else to say about it, really. I, I quite enjoyed it in that regard. Um, again, I thought it was cool. Uh, it's, it puts Strange in kind of this impossible situation. I'm curious to see how he's going to get out of it. Uh, artistically, I do really like this issue. Um, who's doing the art on this one? Barry Kinston? Uh, yeah. Oh, okay, so Barry Kinston with finishes by Scott Coblish and Scott Hanna. Um, so yeah, I'm really, I'm digging it. It's got that very Ditko, you know, magical realms feel to it, where it's just kind of strange and trippy, uh, and, and things don't quite make sense. Uh, you got kind of the 
the Kirby crackle there and stuff. Um, I'm digging it. It looks it looks alright. Uh, I always like Galactus's square pupils. Um, that shit's cool. Uh, yeah, just good. It's a good issue. Alrighty. Go ahead and move along. Next, we will discuss Batman Beyond number 31. Who is trapped in the House of Madness? Uh, first of all, I really like this cover. Terry McGinnis, Batman Beyond, sitting on the sign for Arkham Asylum right above the gates. That's cool. I like that look. I like that even in the future, Arkham has the creepiest fucking sign in the world. Um, and so we start with Bruce Wayne, old man Wayne, visiting Arkham Asylum. Checking in on his investment and trying to keep the people of uh, Gotham safe by treating the uh, people that commit crimes um, Though Bruce still has his hang-ups, uh, he keeps calling them inmates, um, and the doctor has to keep saying guests, because uh -huh. terms such as that minimize their impressions of themselves and inhibit their potential for a full recovery. I like that, and that's, that's a cool idea, but Bruce's having trouble just dealing with it. Um, but then, as they're touring Arkham, the lights go out. There is a power outage. And it does not look good. There must be some kind of breakout. Something bad must happen. Oh no, what's Bruce going to do? Trapped in Arkham? No, no, nope. lights come right back on. Just for an instant, the lights are off, and then they're back on. And Bruce decides, okay, I'm getting out of here. And then he gets in the car, and he drinks. And then he gets home, and he talks to Terry and Matt. And he drinks some more. And he's kind of being a dick. Um, and then they go down to the Batcave. Uh, and Matt says, I never get tired of going down to the cave. And Bruce says, that makes two of us. And they go down there. And then Terry gets ready to go out on a case as Batman. And Bruce says, Bat man so yeah someone uh someone jumped inside bruce wayne's body in arkham asylum i i'm already here for this like this is the thing jurgens is is in my book jurgens is not the type to to um be modest about a plot point let me say that like he he really likes to milk his plot points. This doesn't feel like milking it. This is, mm, this is right on that perfect shine of a level for me where it's like immediately we're clued in that something is wrong. Like a pa literal panels after it happens, we know something's not right. And it's, it's not treated... So when the reveal happens here... It's not treated like it's some big mystery that we couldn't figure out the whole time. It's just like, okay, now our cards are on the table. Here's the situation. So anyways, Terry goes out on a mission, and um, it, it doesn't go well for him. He gets beat up by some kind of like super-powered twins that are in the same body, but they can separate and do sneak attacks. Uh, whatever. <laughs> Anyway, he's thrown into a death trap, um, futuristic death trap that, uh, it's like a vault that tests alloys with a gravity well or something. He's, he's being crushed to death. That's the important part. Um, and Matt's watching it all happen. And he says, my brother is dying, Mr. Wayne. What will we do? And Bruce says, hmm, no idea. Uh, 
Um, and Matt says, you, you can't mean that. Are you sick or something? Never better. Um, so yeah, I just, I don't know, that's a cool kind of shocking thing. And so then we get a reveal that someone in Arkham, uh, let me out, I don't belong here, I'm innocent, I'm not who you think, I'm, I'm, I don't remember. So yeah, it's not this super complex, really, whoa, reveal, it's nice and like, Okay, something's wrong. Um, and, and yeah, I, Akuma Ranger is, just popped up in the comments and says, Issue 31 feels like an episode of Batman Beyond. Yeah, this feels like something we'd actually do in the show. You know, this this feels right on line with, with how the formula of the show worked. And, and I like it because one of the biggest problems I've had with this series is... Terry kind of feels a little bit like a secondary character in his own book. Um, it's it just doesn't feel like like he's been the main focus. A lot of these last couple arcs have felt more Bruce focused, which can work. But I mean, come on, I'm reading Batman Beyond because I want to read about Terry McGinnis, right? I can't. I can get Bruce in like 17 different books. I can only go to one book for Terry. Um, so yeah, it, it's. It's fine to do more Bruce-focused stories. There, there's nothing wrong with that. He's still a big part of that universe. But it, it feels wrong to not focus on Terry. And so while this issue is very focused around Bruce Wayne, all the drama is coming in for Terry. All the drama is coming... All the, the focus, the, the dramatic weight, is more on Terry and Matt here. Of How are they going to solve this situation without Bruce there to help them? Um, you know, just the immediate situation, but then the wider situation. What do they do about someone in Bruce Wayne's body? Uh, that's the really, really cool part. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm kind of digging this. Who's doing the art in this, uh, issue? Rick Leonardi. Leonardi? Leonardi? Um... This is fine. It's it's no Brett Booth. Brett Booth was doing the last arc, and it was really pretty. But, you know, it looked good. It, it looked all right. There's nothing wrong with it. He's doing a good job with the Batman Beyond suit, showing some of the musculature, so you're definitely getting the more fully rendered thing without it just becoming overly um, burdensome. Uh, so that's good. And Shadow of Batman in the comments is asking, is Dan Jurgens still writing Batman Beyond? Yeah, yeah, it's Dan Jurgens. Um, but, I don't know. I don't want this arc to go on for 15 issues. If this is like a two to three issue arc, I'd be happy. It, it, this, this feels like a nice, simple story we can do in an issue or two, and I'm okay with that. That's, that's kind of comic writing that... You know, it's underappreciated for its simplicity. Uh, yeah. That's that's all I got. Um, okay. Let's go ahead and move on to my final single issue of the week. Alright. Let's talk about Heroes in Crisis number 8. Here it is. This is the book that's stirring up all the controversy this week for Tom King. Um, this poor guy just gets so much shit for, for daring to break the status quo in comics. Uh, it it kind of drives me nuts. Um, so, full alert for spoilers for this issue. Um, everyone's mad that Wally West killed a bunch of people. It's framed... It is very purposefully shown that it was an accident, albeit that it was an accident that came from bad decisions. Um, great, cool, yeah. I'm, I'm actually totally okay with that. I, it's not a popular thing to do because then you have to deal with the fallout for it, and dealing with the fallout for it apparently means getting death threats on your Twitter. Um, you know, I just I find it fucking ridiculous. Uh, um, 
window. Yeah, there we go. Uh, Tom King's Twitter feed. I'm doing this too often. Report an issue. We're almost ready to send your report about this person that he's blacked out. And here's his list. I write comic books for DC Comics. This person did not like my comic book, and so they threatened to kill me. Thank you. Send a report to Twitter. Yeah. Here's my reply to that. Uh, people need to realize these are fictional characters. Um, I understand having an attachment to art. I, I do. It's it's important. It's a value. It's un fucking acceptable to to treat people like this. It's unacceptable to th send death threats to comic book writers or artists because you don't like what they're doing with a character or a book. I'm sorry. It's unfucking acceptable. I I understand not liking a book. I understand despising the direction a character is taken in. I did a review of every single issue of Nick Spencer's Captain America run, and by the end of that series, I hated it. I thought Nick Spencer made terrible decisions. You can go back, watch my videos on it. I will likely stand by just about everything I said about that book. I, I do not think anything off the top of my head, I probably should rewatch it and see if I go, ah, no, I don't really agree with that anymore, but by and large, general sweeping declaration, I will stand by everything negative I said about that book. I do not want Nick Spencer to die. I do not want anything bad to happen to Nick Spencer. I don't like Scott Snyder's take on Batman. I made a video where I was ranting and raving. I got really angry and I said some, you know, shit that I probably should have framed better. But... End of the day, I did not threaten Scott Snyder's life because I did not like his take on the character. And that's the distinction. You can not like a, someone's... You not like the way someone's writing a character. You can not like the direction someone's taking with the book. You also are allowed to still buy it and complain. That's a less... Uh, less immediately acceptable thing, but you can do that. You can complain about not liking a book. I've done it. I I understand you're invested in the character. You're there for the ride. You can say, okay, I'm here for it, but I still don't like it, and I really wish they'd go in a different direction. I get it. I know it's a sillier position for some people, but really, I get being along for the ride. Um, what is just, it has to stop when you realize this is a person. If you are ever at the point where you want to make threats against a person for what they did to you, two characters, it's done. You need to stop. You need to get the fuck off the internet and gain some goddamn perspective in your life because that shit is terrible. Okay. So there's the preamble. Wally West is responsible for the deaths of DC superheroes. Okay. What else happened in this issue? Why is he responsible for the deaths? We begin the issue... My name is Wally West. I'm the fastest man alive. This is my confession. These three panels function as as the rest of the book. Like, like, oh, Tom King made Wally West a killer. Okay, no, he didn't, but still. He's, he's owning up to it. He's, he's accepting responsibility. He's doing the right fucking thing from page one. <laughs> like, I just... You need to understand context when you read these things. Like, it's just not... It's not like, oh, Wally West just went to the store and murdered an old lady, and then he's like, oh, well, fuck it, I'm Wally West. I get to do whatever I want. No, it's like, this is this is being handled with weight. This is being handled in a responsible fucking manner. It's... it's The, the death matters. Um, okay. So... Wally West has been dealing with a 
insane amount of dread ever since he's been reintroduced to continuity because everyone around him is saying, oh man, you're like bringing Hulk back to our universe. But he's lost so much personally in order to do that for you. He doesn't have a family anymore. He doesn't have the, the wife and kids that he came back to reality for. And that's really fucking with him. He's having just an ultimate, ultimate crisis about it. And he's breaking down mentally and emotionally. And so he's at Sanctuary to try to get help. And the Sanctuary bots and everything keep telling him, you're not alone in this. Everyone sometimes feels desperate. Everyone feels, you know, like they, they don't have an outlet. And Wally's reaction has been, yeah, but who? Because one of the things about Sanctuary is people there are anonymous. They don't, they don't reveal themselves. They don't even get to see each other. And so Wally makes a bad decision based on paranoia. He thinks that Sanctuary is all some big lie, big conspiracy, made up to, um, to try to make him feel better. So he hacks Sanctuary. He breaks into it, reprograms it, so he can see the other confessions of these other heroes that he doesn't believe actually exist. And then when he sees them, he's so traumatized by witnessing their pain, their confession, and he's so ashamed of himself for doing it, for, for violating the trust that these people had in this place of sanctuary that he just needs to get away from it. He just needs to get out of it and get some air. So he leaves Sanctuary, but doing so sets off an alarm, which makes everyone else that's staying there leave. They see him, and they go to help. And then the explanation here is really, really interesting. <clears throat> Here's the thing that speedsters don't tell you. The speed force is a gift. The greatest gift, the greatest power. But it's also, I'm not complaining, I'm just saying, it's a burden. Having that inside you, and I've had it since I was a kid, it takes control. Every second of every day, you're pushing back at something. You're making sure the world's most dangerous weapon stays put, that it stays inside you every day, every second, and after that, after seeing all that hurt for the first time that day, that second, I lost that control. So what is this? What is this this outburst? Let's talk about it on a couple different levels. I was talking about this with Steve, so I'm going to use that conversation as notes. Um, okay. So Steve says, I'm really intrigued by the way he talked about the speed force and just that moment of losing control. It's so complicated. I'm like, yeah, I'm not sure if that's meant to be like the force of trauma affecting others or if it's meant to be fear of letting others um, in on your experiences, sharing your experiences of mental illness with others. Will it drive them away? Will it hurt them? Will it kill them? Will it leave you alone? And I'm, I'm kind of leaning more toward the second one. The more I think about it, I'm, I'm leaning to the idea that this is the fear of sharing. 
This is the fear that leads people to bottle up their emotions, bottle up their experiences of trauma, and not talk about them, to hide them from other people because they're afraid that if they let them out, they will be left alone for it. Maybe it will physically hurt others. Maybe others just won't want to deal with it. Maybe it will leave you stranded and in a worse place than you were before. That is my take on what this scene is meant to be interpreted as. This isn't the, oh, let's be edgy and make Wally a murderer. This is handled in a very realistic way. It's an accident, but it's an accident that came from poor decision making. It's an imperfect metaphor, or simile, I suppose. This does not paint Wally West as a cold-blooded killer. It paints him more as a drunk driver. Um, and again, that's imperfect because that's more of an irresponsible kind of decision, um, whereas Wally's is a decision based on paranoia, uh, and, you know, rightfully so, um, he, he has a right to be paranoid and, and kind of freaked and, and everything. I, I... I get where he's coming from. Um, I can understand what led him to be so distrustful. Um, yeah. So that's uh, that's about the halfway point of the book. Um, and then we get what Wally's moves have been since then. What started this big mystery? And that's kind of where we get, like, the, the breakdown. Um, so he began to think very quickly and act faster. He manipulated the facilities at Sanctuary to trick Booster Gold and Harley Quinn into thinking they were seen the other commit the murders. He staged the bodies to make it look like it had been a purposeful massacre, leaving clues for Barry and Batman to find. And then he went underground and hid for five days doing something we don't know what yet. At the end of that five days, time traveled met with himself and committed his own murder. Then put the body in the scene. And then we get this this big reveal at the end. Uh -huh. It all worked. It all distracted everyone. It made everyone focus on the murders that weren't and the suspects that didn't. And meanwhile, despite what I'd done, I was free. See, it gave me time. It gave me five days. Five days from the moment I lost control. Five days until I'd come and kill myself. Five days. Five days. Five days for me to do something as good as what I've done bad. Five days, Miss Lane, for me to finally tell the truth. So then the, that really leaves the burning question. What? What does he think he is doing? Because clearly he is not rational. Clearly he is he has a hero complex. He is trying to do something heroic. But 
he's guilt-ridden and already unstable. So what does Wally think he is accomplishing with this deception, with this confession? That's the really interesting part. Ultimately, Heroes in Crisis is a really hard read in, in several ways. Um, it is a, a emotionally complex book, and it kind of hits on a thing with King that, again, to, to kind of come back to the death threats that I started off with, um, I understand not liking what King's doing. Uh, you know, I posted a Geeky Gentleman episode yesterday on uh, Kyle Rayner, and we talked about Omega Men in that. And I think Omega Men is a really well-told story with really interesting ideas and parallels to the, uh, the Iraq War in general, but more specifically just the entire Middle East and what imperialistic involvement has done to that region. I think Omega Men is a really, really interesting series in that regard. But as a Kyle Rayner fan, I find it really hard to read. Because I feel it's not character assassination to Kyle Rayner, but it, it does something to him that is exceptionally traumatic. Because it technically Kyle acts out of character in that run, but in that series, but Kyle couldn't be the happy-go-lucky, fun-loving Kyle Rayner that we know and love if he was through those circumstances. He tries to hold on to it for as long as he can when he's in it, but then it, it changes him. The experience changes him. Um, and that's kind of what you're left with. Like, yeah, once that happens, what do you... You can't be the same person. And so, yeah, I'm, I'm a little bothered. I, as a fan of Kyle Rayner, it does bother me to see that happen with the character. And I imagine as, you know, I, I like Wally West well enough. He's, I'm not like a super fan of him, though. But um, I imagine Wally West fans are kind of reading this and they're like, oh, man, this is just, it's so awful that, you know, Tom King is putting this character that I love through all these horrible things. Tom King is taking what's been done to Wally West to a logical conclusion. If, if you lost everything like that, if you were gone for years and then you, you pushed and pushed and pushed and finally were able to bring yourself back, but then everything that you fought for to come back was gone, how could that not change you? And yeah, you could go, well, then DC just shouldn't have, uh, shouldn't have had him come back with, without his family. Maybe. But they they made the decision that they made because they wanted drama in the books. That's great. Cool. This is the price of your drama. You have to have it affect the character. It's it's hard. It's it's a hard thing to deal with. I, I, I don't find it unreasonable to not like this direction. I don't find it unreasonable to think that this is a, a horrible thing to do to Wally West. What I find unreasonable is to think that we should do what we've done to Wally West and have it have no effect on his personality. Because at that point, Wally West isn't a super optimistic, fun-loving guy. If someone erases your family from existence and you're just all still fun-loving and happy, you're a fucking psychopath. Um, it's, it's sad, but it's like... That's what you gotta do to it. Um, Shadow Batman just made an interesting comment in the live chat. Thanks, thanks for coming live. I, I appreciate that because I, I wouldn't have thought to draw this conclusion. So it's like Emerald Twilight, Twilight, but done today. Yes, and and better. Um, the thing about Emerald Twilight is it was very obviously an editorial mandate. The thing about this is this is the story that King wanted to tell. I don't. From what I understand, he has not been mandated to kill anyone in particular. He's like, I need to tell a sanctuary story. I want to start it in Heroes in Crisis. And yeah, I can. I, I need it to start with kind of like a, a big, dramatic, scary kind of thing. Um, I'll 
I'll talk about this book in a number of other ways that are unflattering to it. Uh, it's had god awful marketing. Uh, DC has no idea how to market Tom King's book uh, books. Like Jesus Christ, I fucking hate this. Talk about this when it came out. Where's that? Where's it now? I can't find it. Yeah, this shit. <laughs> In 21 days, one of these characters dies. That's the worst fucking way to market Heroes in Crisis I've ever seen. Because that's not what the story is about. That's all I gotta say about this book. It's it's a it's a hard book to read. It's asking a lot of an audience that, despite how much it says comics are sophisticated, you know you, you got you got comic fans that'll swear up and down that comics are a little more or an unfairly uh, shat upon medium. They don't get the respect they deserve. They're more sophisticated than people give them credit for. And I absolutely agree with you. But the second, the fucking second. You try to add more sophistication, try to add more emotionally complex and challenging stories to comics. Fans hate it, and they send death threats to the author, and that's not okay. Done. Done with it. Done. Over it. Over it. Anything interesting pop up? No, just everyone really liked my Ben Affleck gif. <laughs> um, that's really funny. I got uh, 93 likes on this gif of Ben Affleck saying fictional characters uh, in response to, to Tom King's death threats. Uh, so yeah, yeah, people need to get the fuck over it. Um, okay, let's go ahead and go on to trade talk, everyone. Talk about something positive. Hi everyone, welcome to Trade Talk. This week we're talking about The Unstoppable Wasp, Volume 2, Agents of Girl. I want to say thank you again to Simeon Scott, who sent me Volumes 1 and 2 of The Unstoppable Wasp. Uh, I've got one more book from him coming up next week on Trade Talk. Not Unstoppable Wasp territory, though, but that's fine. Uh, I do plan to, uh, like, I know this series has kind of been resurrected um, because the trades were selling really well. So I do plan to eventually track down the other trades because I did really enjoy this. So spoiler alert for, for this review, I guess. Um, though I will say, Volume 2 on some levels worked really, really well. On other levels, I thought was, a, like, kind of backtracked a little bit and in ways that I prefer it wouldn't have, but it was still well handled. Um... So, we, we kind of pick up right where we left off in the, the last trade, where um, Ying, yeah, Ying, uh, Nadia's friend from the Red Room, has a bomb in her head, and so Nadia's going to try to find out how to get it out, and she's calling in her Agents of Girl, who's this, uh, this lab of genius girls from around New York, Marvel Universe's New York, to try to brainstorm a way to get it out in less than 17 hours or something like that. And so they all arrive, and it's a big dramatic thing, and they're all interacting with each other, and they're trying to figure out what they can do to get the bomb out of her head. Um, and they're kind of actually hitting it off and having a good time, and it's, it's kind of like a fun sleepover but with dramatic tension um, which is just I, I, I really like this. this this is immediately fun but it's got like some cool drama behind it uh, and then there's like the big comic booky kind of reveal which they're called by their handler who they call mother uh, who is running the the red room and the science class uh, which is the division Nadia and, and Ying were put in um, and so they're given an ultimatum, and I can only deal with one of my girls going away. So, either Nadia, you come turn yourself in, or I'm blowing up Ying's head. And so Nadia, uh, suits up and, and heads off, and they try to kind of like come up with a plan, and I just... The thing I really like is this moment of Nadia kind of going away, immediately accepting, um, you know, accepting the... How do I want to say this? 
immediately accepting the responsibility, um, even though it's it's a you know sacrifice for her. All right, team. Here's what's going to happen. Mother wants me to meet her at a rooftop in the city. We'll be airlifted out by helicopter. It's safe to assume she has one of the pin particle immobilizers that Ying built, so I won't be able to get away. I'm going to walk right up to her, and I'm going to turn myself over. I don't want any of you to try and talk me out of it. My imprisonment versus Ying's life, it's not a choice. What the rest of you are going to do is find a way to get that thing out of her head. I'm going to have an earpiece on. I'll buy you every last second I can. The moment you get that thing disarmed, you let me know if I'm still f free, I'll run for it. I'm packing a couple extra provisions just in case you figure something out. And if this is the last time I, don't, I see you all, don't stop inventing. Don't stop being amazing. Keep girl alive. Oh, I really like that. Ah, that's a great moment. Just for such a nothing character, like I've... I, this this character really just oh it's Hank Pym's long lost daughter raised in the red room that that really should not work that should feel like an ugh, comic books kind of premise but there's so much there's so much communicated in character building character writing um, it just goes to show that any premise can work if you have a really strong character behind it uh, plots complex plots and stuff are cool. But if you can't get invested in the characters, you, you're going to have a hard time staying with the series long term. Um, and, and so just seeing like, you know, this, this situation with, um, with Nadia, who's just this instantly likable character, and she's just as likable to us as she is to people on the street, is just so cool. And she's just such a... It just feels so good, especially in Marvel, to have such just a genuinely good person. <laughs> like, like Marvel's thing is is a lot of their heroes are kind of jaded, kind of, um, kind of, um, not nihilistic, but, but kind of shitty. <laughs> uh, um, like, you know, every, everyone loves Spider Man, but but Spider Man, you know, Peter Parker was that kid who who let a, a robber go because it's not my problem. You know, it's it's no coincidence that everyone in Marvel is from New York, right? <laughs> like, there's there's something to that. Um, yeah. Uh, so anyway, I I like the design for Mother. It's really fucking creepy. Maybe borders a little bit on some tropes that are probably better off not being touched upon. But I'll give it a pass. I'll give it a pass on that because we're getting. Some pretty inclusive stuff. Otherwise, like we've got, um, we got this multiracial uh, young female crew, and they've even included a, a girl who's um, who's disabled. So I'll give it. I'll give a little bit of tropes of oh look what your madness has done to your body. Um, I'll give that a pass in exchange for doing things well that don't play on those tropes in, in other situations. Um, so the agents of Girl uh, have to come up with a plan to get the bomb out of Ying's head, and they figure out how to do phase shifting using spare parts left in Hank Pym's lab um, that make up vision. And so they make gloves that can phase shift the bomb out of Ying's head, uh, saving the day and allowing Nadia to escape. But Mother had a backup plan, and the agents of the Red Room are attacking the agents of Girl, planning to kidnap all of them, not just Nadia. Um, and I, I quite like that. That was pretty cool. Uh, Matt Murdock, who is Nadia's immigration lawyer, is able to show up as Daredevil and help kick ass. Um, and yeah, so it looks like the day is saved. But... Dun dun dun. Ying passes right the fuck out after everything is, is hunky dory. And it does not look good. So then we get the next issue. Um so that's Alright, hold on, let's let's figure this out. Comparing the size of comic book pages is probably 
my favorite thing that I do on this show. All right. So, first section, all told from Nadia's perspective, ends with Ying passing out. Next section of the book, all told from Janet's perspective. So it's about equal, I'd say. Maybe Janet's just a little shorter. Um, but yeah, from there we shift over to Janet, the, the other wasps, uh, POV. And we get two issues of that. And I'm kind of fine with it, but at the same time, I really would have preferred Nadia. Uh, like, I just... I'm reading the series for Nadia. I like Nadia. I'm not not interested in Janet's perspective, but the you know we you've already sold me. You spent six issues selling me on this really cool, upbeat, fun character, and now you've put her into a really stressful situation. And I want to see how she reacts to that. I want to see what what her her reaction is going to be, and I want to stay in her head for that. And then we shift over to Janet's, um, and she kind of. You know, has to help Nadia here, and it's it's kind of crazy because Nadia's freaking out and she doesn't know what to do. She doesn't know who to trust. The ambulance comes to take Ying to the hospital, but she doesn't trust him. Maybe they're spies for the Red Room. Uh, and Janet tries to tell her, um, "Give me just a minute. We can follow the ambulance in my car." And Nadia says, "That's not good enough. They're spies. They'll kill her or worse." Nadia, these are EMTs. They're just going to take her to the hospital. Do you know that? Do you know them personally? I really like that. The idea that Nadia is just this really, really good person uh, who's just open arms, ready to love and hug and, and be the nicest person in the world to literally anyone. The second someone she cares about is in trouble, she can't trust anyone. She cannot trust a single stranger the second anyone's in trouble. The second someone she cares about is in trouble, she can't. She's, she's had a part of her damaged by her experiences. And I mean, if you'd been through something like that, how could you not? You know? I, shit. That's, it's a really tough kind of call to put her in. Um... And so Janet's trying to get her to calm down, but she grabs Nadia's arm as she's freaking out, and Nadia reacts without thinking and punches Janet. Poor Janet. All of her most important moments in comics just involve getting beat up. That's sad. <laughs> um, that's really sad. Uh, but I really like how Janet handles it. Um, you know, it's interesting. Nadia is... Of no relation to Janet whatsoever. She is Hank's daughter from a previous marriage. Both her parents are dead. Or better off dead, at least. Janet should have nothing to fucking do with this kid. And this kid just socked her in the fucking face because she's just freaking out. And it gives you a good sense of Janet's a really good person, too. Janet's the kind of person who can be understanding. Because she says, that was my fault. I should have known not to touch Nadia when she was in this kind of state. And more than that, Janet goes to the hospital, finds Nadia there, pinning down an orderly, and finally gets her to calm down knows how to help her cope with everything that's happening. And then she says, now tell me about all your problems. Let's see if we can fix a few while we wait. And so Nadia explains everything that's gone wrong since she last talked to Janet like two days ago. Um, and so Janet goes and starts making some calls fixing some problems i'll say this um <laughs> you know you're looking at all the text this is probably a little bit overwritten 
Um, though, to be fair, the important parts here are the the internal monologue. The dialogue here is more just like filler, uh, kind of just rounding out the conversation. Um, and I... I would say you could probably cut it and just show the art and it, it all still communicates, but I do think the writer here, uh, Jeremy Whitley, um, I think they do a good job of taking what could be just superfluous dialogue to fill space and time and making it into character building. I think you get a really good sense of the way that Janet interacts with people here, and I, I quite like that. Um, so yeah. But this, of course, is superhero comics, so we can't just have emotional growth. We need fighting to, to properly frame it. Uh, and so some bad guys show up to take Nadia and Yang, and Janet and has to fight them, and Nadia helps, and yada, 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 yada. Uh, turns out Ying is okay. She bursts out of the OR to help in the fight. I thought that was pretty fun, pretty cool. And then the uh, the three of them go home and get tacos and stay up till 2 a.m., uh, which is a really fun ending. And then the next issue is about Janet fixing all of the problems. She takes Nadia and Ying out, and they... Go and they start just dealing with everything that's gone wrong in the last two days. And they get um, Nadia footage of Hank Pym admitting that he, you know, took some of his blood and put it in a tube. And then you get to see uh, Nadia's mother, Maria. Right? Maria? Yeah, Maria. Uh, and, and Hank interacting. And that's really emotional for Nadia, but it also means that they now have DNA evidence that Hank Pym's... They have DNA evidence of Hank Pym so they can match with Nadia, making her an American citizen, giving her space in this city. And then they go to Pym Industries, or Pym Laboratories, and all the agents of girls show up. Um, and Janet reveals that they're giving them a lab. They they get this nice place with all these rooms that they can stay in if they're working on projects overnight. And there's a, even a lab mentor. Um, Barbara Bobby Morris, a.k.a. Mockingbird, joins to be the lab mentor because Nadia inspired her so, and she wants to help inspire other girl scientists in the Marvel Universe. And then it's all nice and positive and yay, and they're going to have a gala night to kind of celebrate the, the creation of the lab. They're all going to get dresses, and that's cute and fun and, and quite adorable. Uh, but then Nadia overhears someone talking about how they can't believe Janet's doing all this for her, given that, one, she's not even her kid. She's Hank's. And Hank hit her. That causes Nadia to start doing some research on parts of her father. And she just cannot fucking believe it. And she's devastated to find this out about her father. And this is probably the scene that worked just the absolute best for me in justifying... Um, I'm not justifying, that's the right word. Um, in cementing... Nadia and Janet's relationship because the next there's a scene shortly after this that really works as well but this one in particular really hit in a good place where uh, Nadia just asks um, I saw it on the internet I don't know how I didn't find out before it's everywhere why didn't you tell me he was evil and Janet you know, it gives a very realistic answer. Um, first, let's get one thing straight. Hank Pym was not an evil man. He did an evil thing, and he had to live with that. There's no excuse to treat a person you care about the way he treated me. 
How could you forgive him for that? Well, honestly, I don't know if forgive is the right word. I accepted what happened and moved on. And then, you know, Janet kind of talks about her experience with Hank um, and how Nadia should not be ashamed to be his daughter because he did something bad. Should not be ashamed, uh, should not feel guilty about that because she has no control over that. And for all his faults, Hank still did a lot of good and he created Nadia and she doesn't have to, to deal with the weight of Hank's mistakes. She can be the best version, the kind, the best kind of person that Hank Pym ever could have been. Actually, let me rephrase that. Nadia can be a better person than Hank Pym ever could have been. I think that's the important takeaway here. Um, so then we get seen a little bit later at the courthouse um, where Nadia is getting you know, official U.S. citizenship, and there's all this talk of paperwork. Um, and Nadia comes out and says, I have to ask you something. I had an idea that is really important to me, and you can say no if you want to, but I hope you won't. And Nadia, take a breath. Okay, the DNS, DNA t test came back, and it says I'm Hank's daughter. Nadia, that's great. Yeah, yeah, whatever. We already knew that. So... I had this conversation with Alexis, and we were talking about parents because both of her parents are dead too, and said how I've never had a family, and she said that with the lab, it was like I was choosing my family, okay? They need to fill out a form for me, and I need a last name, but I've never really had a last name before, okay? And I thought... Pim makes sense, right? My parents' name, why wouldn't I choose that? Except I never knew them, and I don't know what they were like, and my last name should mean something to me. And I could only think of one last name that meant anything to me, and it's Van Dyne, Janet's last name. But I wanted to ask you, because it seems like it would be weird if I just got your last name and didn't ask, or... And Janet just hugs her and says, yes, I'd be honored. And that, to me, is this is such just an interesting relationship that, that has this feel to it of maybe this shouldn't, like, not, not, let me rephrase that. It has this feel to it of everything in the world is against this relationship working, and the personalities and the way these characters are written is just so genuinely overwhelming and and optimistic and deeply connected that it just works oh well i really really love the character work in this book uh if you ever need to give someone a good character study just throw this book in their general direction because there's a lot of a lot of groundwork that's done well with characters um you know, I really like Volume 1. Volume 1 is a really, really strong showing. You could maybe give someone Volume 2. Cold. I don't need know if you need Volume 1 with how well Volume 2 is written. I will say, though, as much as I like this stuff, and I, I really like Janet's perspective on everything, too, I'd be, I'd be curious, I, I don't know, I just, maybe the first issue, maybe issue seven, but I'm not sure if you need issue eight to be from Janet's perspective again. I think they both work, but part of me is a little bothered that we switched over. And, and I think it would have worked a bit better to keep it from Janet's POV. Um, anyway, the, the story concludes with, um, with the girls in the lab testing uh, a teleporter, which is just the most Marvel thing you can do. And so they do a countdown, and... End of the issue. End of the series. It's a really great, that's a, that's a great send-off. Um, oddly enough, this is when this book got canned, because uh, Marvel does this shit all the time. Um, 
that's what can you do? Um, I really like that though. That's that's a great way to end the series in a very optimistic sense. Uh, and like what comes next, what comes in the future, and of course the series got re-picked back up. Um, so yeah, I really did like that. Uh, also worth noting, this trade <laughs> follows suit with the first volume. This trade collects. Oh my god. Um, a story that is a prequel in the back. <laughs> uh, Tales to Astonish number 44, Ant-Man and the Wasp Battle the Creature from Cosmos. And so this is the origin issue for Janet Van Dyne, but it also mentions uh, Maria Pym, um, Hank's first wife. So that kind of gives you the, the background for Nadia in a way, too. Um... Shadow of Batman is in my live comments and he says, what do you think of the art? Again, this is uh, this is pretty good. I, I do quite like the art in this series. Um, it's not like it's not quite to my taste I'd say. I, I don't I don't typically seek out art like this that um, that looks kind of I want to say cartoonish, but that's totally wrong. I will say you could easily see something that's pretty akin to this be animated, is, is kind of what I'm thinking. There's, It's got a simplicity to it in a good way. It's got a nice, like, bare-bones style. I mean, do I have the Green Lantern over here anywhere? Because, like, I love that book. Yeah, here. Okay. So here's a style of art that is to my taste. Uh, the Green Lantern number six by uh, Grant Morrison with Liam Sharp on art. And yeah, I, I really, really love Liam Sharp's art style. This is art that is to my taste. It looks really, really good and really, really cool. Um, I like this intense level of detail. I like this very, very highly rendered, very, um, you know, just intricate kind of artwork that is to my taste this is the kind of stuff i can actually talk about and say like you know look at the hatching look at the the expressions look at the um really interesting character design and stuff you know i, I really like this kind of stuff and i can talk about this kind of stuff for days cool great yeah um that's my personal preference but something like this you know here's an action scene to give you like a cool sense of movement, like the the top here. Um, that's cool. I think that's the top. I fucking know Marvel characters for shit. Um, you know, you get cool looking stuff. Uh, I think the the composition work is good. Like I mentioned, this scene with Janet. I don't think you need the text that Janet's talking here. I think this scene works perfectly well. Uh, probably would make the payoff a little bit better in the next issue. Um, I think the scene works perfectly well without the dialogue. Um, this just isn't really to my taste, though, so I don't really have much to say on it beyond that. But it does really work for the series. The the expressions, the um, everything feels nice and cool. Um, and yeah, I, I dig it. I dig it for what it is, even though it's not really to my personal taste. That's kind of how I come out on it. Uh, so yeah. Really, really good series. Really good volume. Um, I, like I said, I will be eventually tracking down the the next couple volumes. Um, though, it's gonna be a minute. <laughs> That's my two work through stack. I've got to stop myself from buying more trades. Uh, cause, until I get through some of this stuff. It's just it's a little much. I'm, I'm going a little ham. Uh, so yeah, I'm gonna eventually track down more stuff. Yeah, that's, that's what I got. Alright. <laughs> Sorry, RIP headphone users. <laughs> Alright. Yep, so that'll do it for a trade talk tonight. Everyone, thanks very much for watching. Until next time, bye! Everyone, thanks very much for attending Comic Reviews. I had a really good time tonight. Uh, it was fun talking about these different books and such.
catch you later.